All right. Well, it is noon here in sunny Cambridge, Massachusetts. And so um, I am delighted uh, to welcome everyone uh, to this uh, event uh, from the program on negotiation at Harvard Law School. My name is Nicole Bryant, and I'm the managing director here at PON. And on behalf of all the faculty, staff, and researchers, a big uh, welcome to everyone joining us from all over the US and indeed all over the world. This is actually a time at Harvard where we're used to welcoming folks. Yesterday was our commencement celebration. We had graduates from all of our schools convening across our campus. So it has been a very busy and festive time for us. And today we're delighted to continue the festivities by presenting the work of three of our graduate research fellows for the past academic year. Uh, every year, PON sponsors a number of promising uh, doctoral students uh, in their research and work on uh, the fields related to negotiation, mediation, and conflict resolution. And so today we have not one or two, but actually three uh, fellows presenting the work that they have been doing throughout the course of their doctoral studies and more specifically in their time as PON fellows. Um, the structure for today is going to be a little bit different uh, than, than previous for those of you who uh, have tuned into other PON live events. We're going to have three presentations one after the other, I will announce each speaker um, as uh, she, because we have all, all women today, takes the floor. And then um, we will hold our questions for all of them until the end of the event. So we do ask that you have a, if you have a question, you can put it into the Q&A function at the bottom of the chat at any time, but we will stop for questions only once all three of our fellows have concluded. All right, so without further ado, we are going to uh, get to our first uh, presenter today. I don't know if that's uh, a good thing or a bad thing, but at the very least, she will uh, she will finish first. So I will uh, invite Elizabeth Good to stay on camera, and we will uh, say hello in a short while to uh, Katri and Alex are two other fellows. All right, so Katri and Alex, we'll let you go off video. Um, Elizabeth Good is a SH SSHRC doctoral fellow and a PhD candidate at Northwestern University. Her dissertation uses mixed methodology to explore women's representation in peace processes. Elizabeth holds an MA in political science and a BA in international relations and geography from the University of British Columbia. And we're very lucky because next year, Elizabeth will be staying in our orbit as she joins the Belfer Center at the Harvard Kennedy School as a pre-doctoral fellow with the International Security Program. All right, without further ado, I will pass over the virtual Zoom uh, microphone to Elizabeth Good. Sorry about that. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, it is a pleasure to, to be here. Um, and thank you all so much for, for being here today. Uh, thank you in particular to uh, Diane and uh, Nicole for the opportunity. Um, and then lastly, thank you to the entire PO and staff um, for your support throughout the year. Uh, so my name is Elizabeth Good. I am a PhD candidate at Northwestern University uh, and current PON Research Fellow. Uh, my research looks at women's representation in peace negotiations, uh, exploring if and how women advocate for women more broadly. Um, so this particular presentation touches on the role of power uh, and asked how power influences gendered negotiation patterns uh, in peace processes. So with that, uh, let's begin. So the 2016 Colombian Final Peace Agreement is seen as this poster child for women, peace and security. 33% uh, of negotiators were women, 5% of signatories were women, and women represented both uh, the government of Colombia as well as the Revolutionary Armed Forces of Colombia People's Army, better known as FARC or FARC-EP. Uh, so women were on both sides of the table here. Uh, and the agreement itself includes over 100 provisions for women many of which explicitly refer to the gendered experiences of women during conflict. So it's seen as, uh, you know, this example of what happens if we just get women in the room. You know, if women are just sitting at the table, we'll get these really pro-women, pro-feminist final agreements. But that isn't always the case. So the 2007 final agreement from the National Reconciliation Commission-led initiative in Somalia also involved women. 3% of women were signatories, 9% of uh, negotiators were women, and uh, but the agreement itself didn't contain any provisions for women. 
Uh, I, don't, I don't present these two cases um, as a comparative study. I think comparing Colombia in 2016 to Somalia in 2007 is a bit like comparing apples and oranges. But rather, I present these two cases to highlight that simply including women in the room doesn't guarantee that we have these final uh, provisions for women in these agreements, you know including women at the table isn't a silver bullet um, for, for pro-women agreements. So that brings me to my research question, which is what is the relationship between women's involvement in peace negotiations and the likelihood that agreements contain explicit provisions for women? So kind of the wider lens or more generalized version of this question is what's the relationship between women's descriptive and substantive representation? And I'll get to those definitions in just a moment. Um, but I go on to ask, how does power influence this relationship? Is it one woman in a position of power in a leadership position? Is it multiple women in supporting roles? Does this make a difference? So why does this research matter? Why is this interesting? So beyond the very valid uh, argument that women matter, uh, I think that there's also a pretty clear policy application to this research. So since the 1980s, UN policy has been grounded uh, by the assumption that increasing the number of women in negotiations or any room uh, will allow us to refine, uh, increases gender equality. So I think empirically testing this allows us to refine policy that's intended to promote uh, gender equality. Secondly, peace agreements create this window of opportunity uh, to use Miriam Anderson's terminology. So after conflict, there's often a vacuum uh, where stakeholders can uh, sit down to create a new constitution or, or draft a ceasefire. Uh, and underrepresented groups have a chance to advocate for formal recognition of economic, political, and social rights. Uh, and then lastly, this research has the potential to offer insight into gendered power dynamics uh, in negotiation more broadly. So while my research exclusively looks at women in peace negotiations, it's feasible that uh, findings may translate to understanding gender and power in public and private sectors. Uh, so things like local government or your company's boardroom. So to make sure we're all on the same page, uh, just going to quickly define some terms that pop up. So descriptive representation is this idea that an individual with specific identifiers represents a broader population with those same identifiers. So it's the idea that a woman in Congress, for example, will represent women. Substantive representation is the idea that an individual with specific identifiers will advocate on behalf of that broader population. So it's the idea that a woman in Congress will be advocating for things like family leave policy or legislation that you know, closes gender pay gap. And critical mass theory links the two. So the more women that are in the room, descriptive representation, the more likely women specific policy will be implemented, substantive representation. But critical mass theory assumes two things. So the first is that women delegates are willing to advocate for provisions for women. And the second is that this willingness is sufficient to influence agreement outcomes. And I take aim with this second assumption. So I argue that in addition to willingness, women's substantive representation also necessitates ability. Uh, you know, women need the power to influence negotiation outcomes. It's this idea that the driver does not have the same influence as the CEO over Uber policy. And we are painting an incomplete picture if we assume that the Uber driver and the CEO are equal. You know, giving a driver at uh, the seat at a negotiation table doesn't all of a sudden give Uber drivers control over company policy. So to gain a more realistic understanding of any negotiation, I think we need to account for power dynamics uh, between individuals involved. So what did I do? What's the actual research here? Um, so to measure descriptive representation, I look at the percentage of women delegates in official high level negotiation or track one negotiations. These are formalized talks often between government officials and rebel leaders or government to government personnel. Uh, unfortunately, the percentage of women delegates wasn't just available in some data set or database ready uh, for analysis. 
So I went through and I read all 116 comprehensive peace agreements finalized between 1990 and 2021, and I extracted the names of all individuals mentioned in all of these agreements. I then determined the assumed gender of all 2,299 delegates mentioned across the 116 peace agreements, and uh, was able to determine the percentage of women within negotiation delegations based on this. Um, so I'm happy to chat through how I did this in more detail um, during the Q&A, if that's of interest. So then to measure substantive representation, I turned to data that fortunately already existed. Uh, so Bell et al. produced uh, the peace agreement database at the University of Edinburgh. Uh, and all peace agreements are coded as either containing provisions for women uh, or not. So an agreement is considered to have provisions for women if it mentions girls, widows, mothers, sexual violence, gender-based violence, UNSCR, which is the UN Security Council Resolution for Women, Peace, and Security, or CEDA, which is the Convention to End Discrimination Against Women. So when if, a, if an agreement mentions any of these things, uh, then the agreement is considered to have provisions for women. And if it doesn't, then it's obviously considered to not contain provisions. Uh, and then lastly, to measure power, I turned to the uh, position held by delegates. So there are five main positions prevalent in most peace negotiations, and I rank them from most to least uh, powerful. And power is based on how much influence a role has over an agreement outcome. There's lots of different ways uh, to measure power, but in this particular case, I, I look at um, you know influence over uh, over outcomes. So signatories are ranked um, as the position with the most power because they have the capacity to alter agreements by simply refusing uh, to sign uh, an agreement until an, an amendment is made. You know, they essentially have veto power. Negotiators have the ability to influence agenda items and push for specific uh, provisions or, or specific policy, while mediators are uh, striving for a consensus. You know, mediators' number one goal is to get a deal, while negotiators' number one goal is to get what they want. Um, so negotiators are considered to have a little bit more power uh, than mediators. You know, they just have more capacity to shape that outcome, while mediators' hands are a little bit more tied. Advisors are ranked fourth. Um, advisors often have the most technical knowledge in the room, but they're limited to influencing signatories, negotiators, and mediators. And then lastly, we have observers who play a very important role in legitimizing uh, a process, but they often have very little control over the outcome. You know, they're often called silent observers, which is why they're ranked last. So what did I find? 56% uh, of all agreements contain provisions for women. So a bit of a favorable toss of the coin. But this really breaks down uh, once we look at whether or not women are involved or not. So when women are absent, 48% of agreements contain provisions for women. So similarly along that flip of a coin, compared to when women are in the room, 72% of those agreements where women are in the room will contain provisions for women. And so these numbers suggest that it's likely that an increasing percentage of women delegates uh, in a negotiation will increase uh, the provisions for women in these agreements. But in order to test this, I turn to a regression model. Uh, so stay with me here. We're going to walk through this table together. Uh, so in order to claim that increasing the percentage of women uh, delegates is associated with an increased likelihood that an agreement will contain provisions for women, so in order to claim that there's a positive relationship between women's descriptive and substantive representation, you know, number of women in the room, provisions for women, um, I need to make sure that um, this relationship isn't explained by other factors or other hypotheses. So that explains this kind of list of um, factors to, uh, to the left here. Um, so it is possible that uh, international involvement increases the likelihood um, provisions for women are included as well as uh, women are just involved. You know, so organizations like the UN have really publicly committed to prioritizing women's rights. 
So UN-led peace processes may actually explain women's involvement and agreement outcomes. So to account for this alternative explanation, I control for UN Security Council resolutions about the conflict or peace agreement, um, as well as UN, uh, UN Security Council press releases, um, whether or not the UN was a signatory to the agreement, or a third party um, was a signatory to the agreement. So that includes things like the African Union, European Union, or even like a third party state. Um, you know, uh, Norway is often included um, or has a strong presence in, in peace negotiation mediation. So a second explanation is that women's involvement in provisions for women is a result of gender equality. Um, you know, a more gender equitable country may be more likely to include women in negotiations. Uh, and they may be more likely to include provisions for women in the final agreement. So to control for this, I account for whether or not a country has a national action plan or not, which is a country level commitment to UN um, women, peace and security, gender equality kind of protocol, um, as well as I use country level data for the gender development index, uh, gender global gender gap index, and the gender inequality index, as well as independent rankings for secondary education attainment uh, for women and rates of teen pregnancy. Um, so these three different indexes measure gender equality differently. So some look at women's political empowerment, um, some look at women's economic autonomy. So including all three just cast this a wide uh, possible net to account for this alternative explanation. Third, it's a pipeline issue. You know, women need to have a desire to be politically engaged, and so that can explain things. So I account for women's political interest uh, by turning to world value survey data, as well as Afrobarometer data as well as accounting for the percentage of women in parliament. Uh, next, I account for women's experience during conflict. So Elizabeth Brannon and Rebecca Best suggest that high rates of sexual violence uh, in conflict is linked to high rates of women's involvement in peace negotiations, while Jacana Thomas finds that higher rates of women in active uh, combat positions increases the likelihood agreements contain provisions for women. And this makes sense. Uh, because women are often excluded from peace negotiations based on their lack of military experience. So if we increase the number of women in uh, active combat, we're likely to see an increase in provisions for women in peace agreements. And then lastly, I control for international attention by way of measuring New York Times uh, publications about the conflict or peace process, as well as local perceptions of women using World Value Survey and Afrobarometer data. Um, you know, do local people think women can hold positions of power? Do they have a right to, to work? That sort of thing. So taking all of that into account, all of these alternative explanations, I find that uh, I still find that an increase in the percentage of women delegates is linked to an increased likelihood agreements will contain provisions for women. In other words, women's descriptive and substantive representation are positively correlated. And we can see that by this little star here. So this indicates statistical uh, significance. So specifically a one unit increase in women delegates increases the likelihood an agreement will contain provisions for women by 190.4, excuse me, percentage points when accounting for these alternative explanations. So this means that a one unit increase in women delegates almost doubles the likelihood that an agreement will contain provisions for women. But how does this hold up based on provision or position held by women? Um, so breaking down all women delegates by the position they held during the nego negotiations, so we have signatories, negotiators, uh, mediators, and observers. There were actually no women advisors um, that weren't also a mediator, negotiator, or a signatory. So if an individual wore multiple hats, you know, they, they were in multiple positions, they were identified with their highest position of power. So if you were an observer and a signatory in this negotiation, you were labeled a signatory. Um, if you were an advisor and a negotiator, you're labeled a negotiator, you're bumped up. And I did this because you're more likely to influence negotiation outcomes through a higher position of power than lower, even if you're wearing multiple hats within these negotiations. Um, so breaking down delegates by position, we see that the presence uh, of women in signatory positions 
is positively linked to provisions for women. And we see that by these little stars here again. So statistical significance. So women signatories increase the likelihood agreements contain provisions for women. Um, specifically, you know, women signatories increase the likelihood an agreement will contain provisions for women by 134.1 percentage points. However, we see no statistical significance between women negotiators, mediators, or observers. So negotiators, mediators, observers. Um, the essential point here is that agreement outcomes aren't influenced in any statistically significant way by women in non-signatory positions. So for those interested in statistical analysis, I also ran models that explored uh, the relationship between the percentage of women delegates in each positions, uh, in each position and provisions for women and found similar outcomes um, to the binary model uh, on the screen. And so I'm happy to discuss various robustness checks uh, during the Q&A or feel free to, to shoot me an email if you wanna chat stats. Um, so what's the take home point and did I answer my research questions? So I find women's involvement increases the likelihood agreements will contain provisions for women. So yes, women's descriptive and substantive uh, representation are positively correlated. Uh, and I think that this research has large implications for women peace and security policy as well as our understanding of minority representation more broadly, because it's not enough to simply increase the number of women in the room, but rather power matters. Women need to hold positions of power. Women need to have an influence and power over agreement outcomes. Um, and this finding has the potential to expand into private and public uh, negotiations in general. So for example, it would be interesting to see if women are better able to implement gender equitable office policies from the C-suite, or if legislation that benefits women is more likely when women are in uh, executive or cabinet positions. Uh, and I think answers to these questions will help us, you know, uh, craft better diversity, equity, and inclusion policies. Um, but lastly, I leave you with a quick note of caution. So findings are not suggesting we simply need to increase the number of women in signatory positions and that that will just solve gender equality. And that's because findings do not account for women delegates' willingness to advocate for provisions for women. So no two women have identical interests or experiences. Not every woman delegate will support women-specific policy in uh, a peace negotiation setting. You know, we're going to see variation at, at the case level, you know, uh, looking at Colombia and Somalia, for example. The take-home point is here is not that any woman can represent all women. You know, we can't just throw women in here and, and stir and hope for the best. Um, that said, what this research does find is a general trend across cases. So while women are capable of advocating for anything, and each delegate is likely to have diverse interests and priorities, women on average advocate for provisions for women more than all male delegations. So this also suggests that men have an opportunity to do more to advocate for women in uh, peace and security sector. Um, you know, it's not women's sole responsibility to prioritize gender equality, but rather advancing gender equality requires a team effort um, by all genders. So with that, I thank you so much, uh, and I really look forward to your questions, and I will uh, toss this back to Nicole. Lovely, Elizabeth. Thank you so much. It's uh, You're a wonderful presenter and your research is fascinating. And we have a number of questions for you already in the Q&A, including from one of our executive committee members, Jared Curhan at MIT. But you have the luxury of going to think about those answers for a second while we bring on our next graduate research fellow. So this is a good a good format for that. So thank you for your time. Uh, and, uh, and we'll see you shortly in a bit. All right, next up, Alexandra McAuliffe. Um, thank you and hello, Alex. So Alex is a doctoral candidate at the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy at Tufts University, and her work fo focuses on gender negotiations and peace building. Prior uh, to uh, her doctoral work, uh, Alex has been a facilitator with uh, peace building groups in Northern Ireland, as well as Seeds of Peace, a youth-centered uh, leadership group she holds an MA from the Fletcher School at Tufts University and a BA from uh, Colby College, and we're 
quite pleased to announce that she will be staying likewise in our orbit and continuing on as a PON visiting researcher uh, for the upcoming academic year. So Alex, uh, very thank you uh, to you for being here today and I will now turn over the floor. Great, thank you, Nicole. And it is wonderful um, to be here and thank you all for being here. Um, one moment while, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Not letting me share my screen, apologies. There we go. Okay, sorry about that. Um, so thank you all for being here. And uh, thank you, Nicole. It's been such a wonderful opportunity to work with PON um, this whole past year. And um, I am quite fortunate in that I'm presenting after Elizabeth as our work is quite complimentary, as you can perhaps see from the title. Um, I'm also thinking about gender hierarchies and peace negotiations. So I'm going to be taking a deeper dive into one of the points that she ended with, um, which is that women in the role of negotiator does not necessarily result in improved outcomes for women. And I try to understand why this might be using qualitative methods and a case study of Northern Ireland. And something that might surprise you is that Northern Ireland is actually the second most dangerous place in Europe for women. In 2015, I had just moved to Northern Ireland and was working for a small organization um, that did dialogue facilitation. And we were doing a small session with groups of women and they kept saying, we're ready for peace. We're ready for real peace. And I remember being surprised and somewhat confused by this because it was 2015 um, and the peace agreement was signed in 1998. But what they went on to say was that their fundamental daily struggles and particularly these gendered sources of insecurity had really been unchanged. And they felt that their experience of the conflict and their needs for peace had not been addressed in the peace process. And this was the case despite the fact that Northern Ireland, that the Northern Ireland Women's Coalition was party to the peace negotiation process. They were not just there, um, but they had organized as women on behalf of women. And yet clearly this was not enough to result in meaningful, tangible changes in the experiences of security for so many women. And so why was this the case? And to try and figure this out, um, I look at how are peace negotiations gendered in terms of their structure, power, norms, and outcomes? To what extent can inclusion change, shape, or impact the process? What are the limits of this? And what would it mean for negotiations to embrace a more feminist and transformative approach to peace? However, um, as uh, the women in the dialogue sessions comments reflect, and as Elizabeth's research suggests, it wasn't enough to be simply in the room. So today I'm really focusing on the second question, what can inclusion do and what can it not do? Um, so to some extent, I will touch on all three. And what I find is that there are real structural limitations to the impact women are able to have, even as formal participants due to their positioning within the process. And so first, just to give you a super brief background to the peace process, which I'm sure many people are very familiar, but to make sure everybody's on the same page here. Um, in 1921, Ireland was partitioned with Northern Ireland here in the yellow um, being part of the UK and it was designed uh, to ensure a Protestant majority and a Catholic minority, which led to significant discrimination against the Catholic community, including um, housing and employment were allocated based on religious affiliation rather than need. Um, and there was significant gerrymandering to ensure that basically there was no Catholic representation in government. And this is a very kind of basic overview. I recognize that there's um, lacking some nuance here, but for the sake of understanding. Um, in the 1960s, inspired by the civil rights movements taking the world, there were peaceful marches across Northern Ireland, which were subsequently met with violence. In 1969, the British government sent the military in in hopes of quelling the violence, which um, was not what took place. And instead, this began 30 years of conflict known as the Troubles involving the Irish Republican Army or the IRA, the British Army, and a host of loyalist paramilitaries. 
And as you can see here, there were a host of many steps along the way to get to the much celebrated 1998 Belfast Good Friday Agreement. Um, but I'm going to kind of fast forward through some of them um, to the spring of 1996, where the British and Irish governments announced that there would be elections to determine um, the parties to participate in a peace process. A group of women um, concerned that women's experiences and ideas would be overlooked overlooked, approached the governments and um, all political parties, urging them to take steps to ensure women's representation. Hearing little by way of response, they decided to form their own party, run themselves, and thus created the Northern Ireland Women's Coalition, which was comprised of women from all across Northern Ireland, um, and importantly, from women from both sides of the community divide. Their campaign was successful and they earned a spot as formal talks to the peace process. So there's your little bit of background. What did I do um, in this research and trying to get at this question of, of what impact they were able to have? Well, I relied on two primary data sources, archival documents and interviews. For the archival work, I won't really go into depth about now, just to say that it consisted of thousands of documents, um, including government correspondences, women's coalition internal papers, the negotiation minutes, um, and I'm happy to speak more about this in the Q&A and what they um, held. But I also conducted about 40 interviews with Irish government officials, British government officials, members of the women's coalition, um, as well as current individuals working on activism and different service delivery components um, to do with gender equality in Northern Ireland today. And I focus specifically on the two governments as opposed to the rest of the parties that were part of the talks, um, because it was the governments who were really the drivers of the process. And so they um, held much of the decision and design process and power. And of course, the Women's Coalition to speak to what it meant to try and exist within that process. And as a brief aside, um, you might be asking why Northern Ireland, why even study it, isn't it settled? They just celebrated the 25th anniversary of the agreement and much has been written about it, which is all true. But I would argue that it actually makes the perfect case study um, because when we think about negotiations, much of what we study is external especially with women's inclusion, what we know is kind of coming from the outside and trying to apply it to observations um, about gender inequalities and exclusions and apply that to the negotiation process. And this makes sense because negotiations are closed and often confidential processes, which makes them very, very, very difficult to study in an up close and personal way. Um, however, looking at Northern Ireland right now is quite beneficial. Um, because of the time that has elapsed since the negotiations took place, people are far more willing to speak and speak openly and reflect critically about what happened, why they did what they did, the choices that they made. And this wouldn't have been the case, you know, in the years directly following the agreement. Um, secondly, the time elapsed has also meant that all of the documents that were under embargo by both governments are now unclassified. So there's an entire treasure trove of documents and information about the really intimate calculations that were being made that are now available for study. And so my research is really trying to take a fine tooth comb to the process and look at these intricacies and intimacies of the talks. So with that, what did I find? Well, to start is that many of the assumptions made about women's involvement and how it shapes the process are incomplete. Um, there's often this idea that women are more trusted. Um, the assumption being that women are not typically primarily combatants, though not exclusively. And so therefore they are more accepted by the other parties. And this opens up a lot of space for compromise. Um, this was not the case in Northern Ireland. Nobody trusted them at the beginning. And this was partially because they were seen as defying traditional gender roles. So there were a smattering of other women across the other political parties involved, and they saw that the Women's Coalition were undermining them. They had followed the rules, they'd come through the ranks, they had deferred to male party leadership, and here was this new party trying to overturn the status quo without earning it. 
And so they did not trust these women at all. Um, but then also the other parties writ large did not trust them. As you can see from this quote from a government official that I interviewed, the big parties could react quite aggressively. They tend to be quite protective of their position and reacted with, who are these people? Um, and categorization in Northern Ireland is was and continues to be, in, to some regard, how people were made legible to one another. So everything was organized according to identity, uh, particularly one of the primary issues within the negotiation, which was known as the constitutional question, should Northern Ireland belong to the UK or Ireland? And the fact that the Women's Coalition did not take a stance on this issue made them very difficult to place and very, very difficult to trust. So this idea that they had some advantage, some greater ground for compromise um, was simply not the case. They did become trusted um, by most parties, but this was not at all due to their status as women, but rather it was they made it a priority that they worked diligently um, through building relationships and maintaining regular communication with other parties. Next is we found that the Women's Coalition possessed immense negotiation skill. And there's a common narrative that women don't have the skills to be effective peace negotiators, um, that they don't have the political background, that they don't have the education. And it's absolutely true that women often face um, resource and gendered structural barriers, absolutely. However, although the Women's Coalition did not have the political or military backgrounds um, often associated with peace negotiators, Women in the Women's Coalition came from a wide range of experiences. They were activists, academics, trade unionists, community workers, caregivers. Many of them had been on the front lines of the fight um, for gender equality, um, which was a cross-communal effort. Others had been trade unionists, which was also working across community. And they had years of training and experience working across these party lines, which none of the other political parties had. And so this made them very, very effective at some of the really most basic elements of interest-based negotiating. Um, they would talk to anyone, regardless of who they were. And more importantly than talking, they would actually listen, um, which really gave them the ability to understand the nuance of the other party's positions. And therefore, because of this, they could generate really creative options because they knew what would and wouldn't be accepted by the other parties in ways that many of the other parties simply did not. And you can see from these two quotes from different officials that I interviewed, um, it was the role they played brokering the deals, brokering deals within the talks process behind closed doors very often, which was so important. And that often doesn't get the, the credit or the recognition that they were there able to broker those, those deals. And then second, that they helped create a center ground and push it out again, because they understood what could and couldn't be acceptable to many of the other parties. Um, and then it will probably be a surprise to no one um, involved in this space that the Women's Coalition did introduce a wider set of issues. They were interested in broadening the scope of issues, both in terms of um, different groups and the experiences they had had during the conflict, and also what was necessary for different actors for peace. And this was a member of the Women's Coalition I interviewed who said, you see, it was the culture in Northern Ireland. For 30 years, it had been angry, aggressive, all security related, defense and military, and all of that stuff was just not our interest. Um, instead, they advocated for things like victims recognition, a civic forum, proportional voting, integrated education, human rights. But what you don't see here explicitly in this list um, are explicit gender provisions. And there are two possible and I think interrelated explanations for this that came up in some of the interviews. Uh, the first is that focusing on gender provisions is a pretty narrow conception of gender equality. Um, every issue has gendered implications. The Women's Coalition, rather than focusing on elements that might be seen as specifically for women, so to speak, instead focus their attention on broader issues that had an outsized impact um, on women's experiences in conflict. So for example, the civic forum would have been a civic body established alongside a political assembly um, 
women are overrepresented in civil society and the voluntary sector more broadly. And so this would have provided another important avenue for representation alongside calling for more proportional representation in the election system to ensure um, that the smaller voices and smaller parties would be, would be heard. The other explanation for the lack of um, explicit gender provisions is it simply wouldn't have been tolerated um, to advocate for these specifically. As noted, they were not exactly received warmly. Um, and one women, woman of the Women's Coalition that I spoke with was described to me a situation of sitting down to an initial meeting with the other parties about what government structures would look like. And before she'd even sat down, a member of another party was wagging their finger at her and saying, quotas, they want gender quotas. They want quotas for women. And I'm telling you, that's not going to happen. And the Women's Coalition had never even proposed gender quotas. So there was this real recognition that these issues were dead on arrival in, in many respects. Um, they didn't even need to raise them to be greeted with suspicion and attacks. Um, of the issues that they did advocate for, victims recognition, the civic forum, integrated education, recognition for the need of a bill of rights, all made it into the agreement. Additionally, um, the line, the right of women to full and equal political participation was also in there and specifically referenced women. However, what gets implemented of this? Victims recognition did get implemented and has been relatively successful. Um, and the civic forum also got implemented. However, uh, a few years after being established, the civic forum was shut down. Education is still 93% segregated and 25 years later, there still is no bill of rights. Um, so why is this the case? Why were they there? They advocated and yet still, um, this is what we're left with. The ability for victim recognition and everything else is out the window. Well, I identified two primary factors. Um, and again, a surprise to no one, peace is a process. Uh, as you saw on the background slide, all of this um, took place before the women's coalition, the women co women's coalition's existence. Each step informed the next and built off the previous. So the governments consulted heavily with the primary parties, the biggest parties, about what the structures of the talks should be, how parties should be selected, the main issues for consideration, who the chairperson should be. And so by the time the women's coalition even came into existence, all of this was already decided. Um, and so they could tweak around the edges, but the construction and the design of the table were really complete. And the issues therefore that they were trying to get through were really add-ons to what was seen as the core of the process. Furthermore, um, as is often noted, agreements are just the beginning. They're the beginning of the work. And so following the Belfast Good Friday Agreement, there have been four subsequent agreements. And the Women's Coalition was not included in any of the subsequent talks. Um, so the compounding effects of this can be seen in the fact that of the elements mentioned previously, victims recognition is the only one that remains. And so from all of this, all of these years, this is really the only place um, that, they, that they were able to insert themselves. And as one government official described to me, Listen, every society wrestles with change. Societies, institutions, behaviors, allocation of power, all has structural memory. You can try and push something some way, but it will bounce back into the shape that it was before. There is hardened structural memory in Northern Ireland because everyone is in a contest to keep their share of the power. And this quote really speaks to the problems with inclusion. Um, and largely representing just one moment in time and without the sustained commitment to it as an element of the entire process, um, highlighting some real structural problems with relying on inclusion alone without um, other measures in place to ensure more equal outcomes. And then second, and perhaps most profound, and as Elizabeth also suggested, much of this comes down to power. The Women's Coalition did excuse me, did not have the coercive leverage available to many of the other parties. Um, 
as one member of the Women's Coalition put it half jokingly, half not to me, we had no paramilitary wing. There was no option to walk away because in negotiation terms, they had a very bad BATNA, a best alternative to a negotiated agreement. If they threatened to walk away, no one would stop them. And this makes it very, very difficult to push through substantive change. And its government official put it to me like this, at the end of the day, we knew that the women's coalition would go along with whatever consensus was emerging so that we really, so that's really why we didn't have to worry too much about them. This being said, um, the women's coalition did make the best of a very bad hand um, by developing other forms of leverage that weren't coercive. Um, so in procedural terms, they advocated certain process changes, such as how items were voted upon to increase the power of the smaller parties and ensure that their voice could not be totally ignored um, in the consensus gaining process. They also engaged in relationship building and relationship leverage. As noted again, they did not come in as a trusted party, but they built it. They spoke with everybody and they listened to everybody. And they made themselves in this way really, really indispensable to the chairman, to the governments, and to the other parties by being able to spell out the nuance of different party positions. And so that they also made that consultation with them was really required to understand what was happening and what was possible. And finally, they developed informational leverage, meaning they had policy papers on every issue imaginable. They didn't just draft papers outlining their position on the issue, um, but they drafted potential solutions, meaning they could really help anchor the conversations and the universe of options so that even if they didn't have the ability to stand their ground on certain outcomes, they could still help shape the formulation. And again, the contribution is summed up nicely with this quote from a, an official that says they were very strong on issues of transparency, proper government governance, proper procedure, fairness, and inclusion. So again, they made the best of a bad negotiating hand, absolutely, but there were fundamental limits to what was even possible within the confines of the negotiation process. So what do we do with this? Um, there are limitations inherent to the structures of these negotiations that curtail the impact that women are able to have. And there's an assumption um, undercutting a lot of inclusion discussion and literature that groups entering on behalf of women or civil society are on equal footing as the other politically or military oriented parties. And this is just rarely true. Inclusion is important. And you saw there are there are important impacts it can have, um, but by failing to recognize the structural limitations, we are putting immense burden of change on some of the most marginalized actors within the process. And to some extent, setting them up to fail um, without this recognition of the institutional factors that are also at play. But it's not all doom and gloom. Um, this deep case analysis suggests that there are process changes that can be made to really even the playing field. And that the practices employed by some of these um, in a subordinate position within negotiations can actually improve the negotiation process for everyone. And so we really need to ask what we can learn from these groups about the types of skills and strategies um, that don't just serve to make negotiations negotiations a more equal space, but actually produce nego better negotiated outcomes for all. And I recognize, I apologize, I'm being a little bit vague here, but um, this is what I'm working to develop in the next steps of my dissertation research. And I'll just end by recognizing that this is just one case study um, and there are specifics to it that are not found in other places. Negotiations are complex and they are context specific. But what I found here, it's, it's not going to be the same as everywhere else, but rather it helps us understand where the cracks are, what are the questions and ideas we need to be taking account into account when thinking about what structural changes need to be in place to ensure that all the parties have a more equal footing to enact substantive change. So thank you very much. I look forward to hearing your questions, and I will pass it back to Nicole.
Thank you very much, Alex. Great presentation. We really appreciate it um, and all of your energy. So we look forward to seeing you in just a few minutes uh, back on video. All right. And without further ado, I will uh, introduce our uh, third uh, graduate research fellow, um, uh, Katri uh, Nosiainen, uh, who is a lawyer and a member of the faculty at the Hankin School of Economics. Uh, Katri uh, is conducting empirical research on the impact and value of legal design and ethics in commercial contracts using the lens of law and economics. And she's going to present a little bit more about this in just a few minutes. Uh, one thing I love about Katri is her, her CV allows me to practice lots of different uh, accents because she has degrees from uh, all over Europe, uh, Erasmus University in Rotterdam, University of Bologna, uh, Paul Cézanne ex Marseille, and uh, a degree from International University of Odente. So uh, it is always a pleasure uh, to have uh, a conversation with Katri. And without further ado, I now see the Zoom floor. Well, thank you so much, Nicole, and thank you so much, PUN, for having me here today and uh, giving this opportunity to present my, uh, my recent research. So hi, everyone. So today I will be discussing my latest research on measuring the impact and value of legal design in commercial contracting. And I have been conducting empirical research in legal design and ethics in commercial contracts ever since 2018. In 2019, I was conducting research in France at Aix-Marseille School of Economics. And during the years 2020 and 21, the research was conducted at the UC Berkeley and since 2021 at the University of Cambridge, UK and Harvard Law School. Um, I conducted the empirical part of the research in collaboration with an international law firm and international record company. My work is supported by the Scholarship Foundation for Economic Education, Design Forum Finland, Paolo Foundation, Hanken Foundation, and Harvard Program on Negotiation. So what will be covered in today's presentation? Well, we will be discussing some of the incentives and advantages of employing legal design. We will be also discussing the ways of measuring the impact and value of it. And we will be discussing about comprehension, a new quality metric and another way for assessing efficiency. So this will be covered through my empirical case study. Well, first, I think it's important to discuss what is legal design and where it originated? Well, the idea behind legal design is to make judicial information, services, products, and processes more understandable and approachable by using humor-centric design. So legal design, we can say that it has some of its roots in Stanford Law School and D School, and especially at the Stanford Legal Design Lab, which is found and heated by a famous legal designer, Margaret Hagen. My work, however, it differs from the works conducted at Stanford, as it has intended to find a way to scientifically measure the impact and value of legal design and to find metrics to assess efficiency and quality of legal products, services, and processes. Moreover, it has intended to provide guidelines for measuring the value and impact of legal design. It is shown that legal design, it works in at least four major ways. Namely, it improves. It improves quality, ethics, and efficiency whenever the applicable contract practice uses a more human-centered approach. Secondly, we can say it empowers. It empowers people, it empowers societies, communities, and entities to reduce, or at the best, even fully eliminate information and knowledge symmetry between the contracting parties. Thirdly, it demonstrates. It demonstrates that law and economics, well, is not just a theoretical science of neoclassical economics, but rather it uses empirical research to present numerical data to verify potential value 
and impact of a given legal product or service. Last but not the least, it supports. Its empirical research data can be used to support efficiency and ethics in decision and policy making. Well, more human-centric approach to law is reached by combining design methods as well as the latest innovations in the field of technology. Other fields of science are used to find best practice solutions to challenges at hand. And as we can see from this picture, legal design approach is highly interdisciplinary in its nature as it tries to learn from other fields of science and have a dialogue with them in order to find new best practices that could be applied with law. Legal design, well, it combines, but is not limited to fields such as visual arts, linguistics, technology, engineering, business research, neuroscience, psychology, or law and economics. Next, I would like to discuss the empirical research design and present the case study at hand. Well, as we shortly discussed it, the research was conducted during the years 2018 to 2022. And the work studied the possibilities and challenges of legal design in relation to commercial contracting within the law and economics framework. It was the intention to find a way to scientifically measure the impact and value of legal design and to find metrics to assess efficiency and quality in commercial contracting. Moreover, it was the intention to establish guidelines measuring the quality in legal field. Uh, a cost of benefit and analysis of legal design was conducted from several different angles to give a broader view of the impact and value of legal design in company services, products, and processes. I compared legal concepts by using tools of economic analysis of law to better understand this legal phenomena. I could say that law and economics provide for excellent tools to understand what are those things that need to be carefully monitored and why. So in order to conduct research, we need measurable data to see legal design as a stage of a science. And law and economics can provide tools for that end. For instance, within this case study, a punch of metrics from stakeholders and other operating firms were carefully monitored during the project to agar data to measure the impact and value of legal design. For my knowledge, uh, this work uh, has been the first intent to conduct academic empirical research in the field of legal design in commercial contract within the twist of law and economics. An artist conduct was redesigned and analyzed. Well, for the end users, as we know, contract terms may be complex, excessively burdensome, and difficult to understand. Unfortunately, often the relevant contract terms are challenging to discover or even evaluate before a contract becomes binding. Significant information asymmetry is often present with artist contract, and the bargaining power is not equally being divided. Artist contracts may at one level seem like contracts of a hazard. And music business might seem like a wild, wild west for somebody who is not operating there or have the specific knowledge of customary practice and the silent terms within the field. This is also often the case for newcomers and youth artists who have not acquired a field specific experience and knowledge. For all these aforementioned reasons, an artist contract was chosen as a suitable example to conduct an empirical case study on comprehensibility, knowledge empowerment, and on legal quality. So what I did, I used an artist contract that the lawyer had recently renewed using traditional legalese approach. And then I renewed the same contract using legal design approach. The legal design approach redesigned artist contract was then compared with the renewed traditional legalese contract. And the different forms of the artist contract were tested empirically with the stakeholders. 
The prediction here was that the advantage of legal design approach is to create more comprehensible contracts. And what is meant by comprehension? Well, comprehension, it is meant here that the parties can read, they can understand the contracts in terms without the need to having to have to uh, hire a lawyer or having to have legal background themselves. And as regards the studies design, well, subject, they were required to participate via internet open call for people working in the music industry through industry unions, as well as other music industry operators and stakeholders contact recommendations. Uh, altogether, 24 subjects were participating in the study. 22% of them were in female and 78% of subjects were male. And naturally, because it's an uh, academic study, these subjects were paid nothing for their participation. Well, the study, it tested some of the hypotheses that represented my early work on the general theory of legal design in law and economics framework. And the study tested the basic hypothesis that the advantage of legal design approach is to create more comprehensible contracts. The prediction here was that the contractual terms that are written with traditional legalese are more difficult for the stakeholders to comprehend and they will create negative emotions, increase risk and transaction costs than legal designed contract terms. Further, it was predicted that legal design contract terms will bring benefits such as increased understanding, approachability, better risk management, positive emotions like empathy and trust, more positive view of the drafter, more deep-rooted contractual commitment, and the decreasing of transaction costs. And each of these conditions were evaluated for subjects' own understanding of the artist contract terms. So for instance, fairness and more deep-rooted contractual commitment. This inquiry builds on the moral psychology literature that shows strong commitments to contracts. And as within this literature, I expected to find increased perceptions of fairness are associated with increased compliance to the terms of a contract irrespective of the legal mechanism to challenge or exit. And as it with artist contract, it is often timely quite unclear when the contract ends or what are the means to terminate this kind of a contract. As regards ascent, transparency and comprehensibility. Well, this inquiry, it builds on the subject own understanding of the scope of the agreement and whether this scope was transparently communicated in the contract terms and whether it was comprehensively presented. So this study, it followed seven states for renewing nonlinear approaches, which is adapted from the design thinking approach to innovation, which goes for empathizing, uh, defining, ideating, prototyping, testing, uh, implementing, and last but not least, following up and improving. And in measuring the impact and value of legal design, uh, metrics are often being divided into three different categories. Namely, we have qualitative metrics, um, monetary indicators, and other quantitative metrics. And next, I will discuss these metrics in more detail. So as regards quality metrics, we might have been able to follow certain metrics such as customer feedback through satisfaction surveys, uh, how many reclamations they are, uh, amount of judicial proceedings, whether they are court proceedings, arbitration proceedings, but also the number, how many of the clients, for instance, voted with their feed and changed for the, for the competitor. As regards monetary indicators, we might be following metrics such as transaction cost, administrative cost, different marketing cost, uh, new customer segments or the sales from there, or we might be interested of a customer lifetime value. And just to maybe be uh, clear in here that these metrics might naturally different case by case. What are the things that we want to monitor and analyze more deeply? And other quantitative metrics. And here we can, for instance, find social media visibility, like how many likes or dislikes there might be, 
uh, how this might reflect the visits on companies' websites. We can see maybe something from the algorithms, or we can maybe have a look on the market share, or just like a transaction cost. We might be interested to see how much time we are spending on something, what kind of efficiencies these can bring. Well, as regards the results, well, it was found that the advantage of legal design is to create more comprehensible contracts. The study shows that nearly two thirds, so that comes our 62.5% of the participants preferred the legal design contract terms over the traditional legalese terms. The results show that the legal design contract terms were regarded more comprehensible even for lawyers and sophisticated parties. As regards conclusions and implications, well, this work has presented a small case study in a particular industry. And based on my earlier works, general theory of legal design in law and economics framework and legal design in commercial contracting and business sustainability, new quality metric standards, I tested some of the anticipated benefits and metrics of legal design. Even though, the conducted study is only just a small experiment. The novel and parka results are promising. The results show that legal design at contract was regarded as more comprehensible, even for lawyers and sophisticated parties. So the study found that almost two thirds, namely 62.5% of the participants, preferred the legally designed contract terms over traditional legalese terms. While, while I acknowledge that comprehensibility is not the only goal in negotiation and contracting, and it isn't the goal of all contracting party, here is why it might be particularly important in the record business going forward. Namely, record business has been under constant change as new technologies has been gradually entering into the field. Music, is no longer only produced and distributed through record companies, but also other operators and new ways to produce and distribute music have entered the field. These chains on how to produce and distribute music has had significant impact on the old underlying power dynamics within the music industry. The record business has faced a remarkable change. The rise of streaming and, for instance, TikTok and Spotify have even challenged the existence of and the need for record companies. Further, this change has implications, for instance, or repeated players and contacting party dynamics. And the change in the industry cannot be ignored and it surely affects also record companies' negotiation and contracting practice. And what legal design does here, well, legal design applied to the negotiation and contracting practice can foster record companies in adjusting these changes in the market. Furthermore, this case study has wider implications for negotiation and contracting generally. Since having legally written contracts that one level might seem like a contract of adhesion are really not enough for record business going forward. Quite the opposite. There is a pressing need for more human centricity in negotiation and contracting practice, and this is particularly with industries which are in transition. Record companies should take this change in the dynamics into the account within their negotiation and contracting. To demonstrate, we have seen real life examples where it would have been in the record company's best interest as being a repeated player in the market to make their contracts more comprehensible and fairer. Incidents where it has proved bad for the record company to, to act otherwise, just as recent ones, Taylor Swift, or the ones from more of the history, just like Prince. Finally, the study has shown that just knowing the law is no longer enough to bring competitive advantage, business sustainability, and differentiate among legal operators, but that in the legal profession, the quality of our services and products 
has actually a more pivotal role. Lawyers should no longer be the only ones, the magical wizards who understand legalese. Rather, law and legal information, that is something that should actually be made comprehensible for all, for lay people, for general audience. And this body, I would say, we bring forth a call for action. Particularly lawyers have an important position to safeguard the empowering of people within their legal matters and decreasing the legal and information asymmetry that we currently have present in the society. So what we can do, we can imply from these novel results that comprehensibility is needed in negotiation and contracting practice, and that the legal design can bring systemic impact in society in decreasing information and knowledge asymmetry. Moreover, this small experimental story has demonstrated that legal design is a useful mean when looking for a solution and ways to improve legal quality. Thank you so much. All right, thank you so much, Patri. And you know, I realized after I introduced you that I omitted to say that you are also gonna be staying on as a PON visiting researcher next year. So we're delighted. Um, thank you for your presentation. And I'll take this occasion to say thank you for the chocolates in the office over the course of this last year. Uh, it's been a delight. Um, wonderful. Um, I, I will uh, invite everyone back on screen, all three of our fellows for this question and answer period. And I'll also take this occasion um, to say a big thank you to all of the folks who make their presence at PON, not only for this particular group, but year after year for this cohort possible. So our executive committee who has, you know, uh, placed a great value on uh, funding uh, new research and the next generation of scholars, uh, our assistant director, James Kerwin, and our uh, coordinator, Diane Long, who do all of the hard work in welcoming these fellows and shepherding them throughout the year and being really great resources for all of their questions. Um, it has really been a pleasure to get to know this, uh, this group this year, and we look forward to welcoming two new fellows for the upcoming academic year. All right, we are going to go to questions. We have a number of them. I will say in advance that we are probably not going to be able to get to all of them, um, and when, uh, when possible, I will uh, uh, shorten at some point. But if you do have a question that we're not able to treat today, um, I believe that everyone has shared their email all of our fellows in, in their presentations or in the chat. And if not, please let us know and we can communicate that so that you can follow up. All right, we are going to start um, with a, a question for Elizabeth since she went first and has had a little more time to reflect. Um, and we'll just keep everybody on screen for this as if it were a, a panel in a room and we were all sitting together. Um, and so we're gonna start with a question from Jared Curhan, um, uh, one of our executive committee members uh, who says, thank you for this wonderful research. Uh, I know you, that you are primarily are looking at provisions for women, but have you looked at whether outcomes for women improve outcomes for other diverse groups as well, um, including you know uh, diversity uh, of other kinds? Elizabeth, has this been something that has has crossed your path? Yes. So, um, so I look at women just in general. I think that kind of the next step would be looking at the link between women representing women, so women civil society organizations. Um, and my hunch is that women civil society organizations, when those have um, when they have seats at the table, that it's also likely that you would see other civil society groups better represented. So things like youth or LGBTQ um, organizations, but I don't have the data on that. The second kind of part of your question of whether or not women's involvement results in outcomes that are benefit or better for larger groups rather than just women, I have looked at. Um, and I see that th there's a positive correlation between women's involvement and provisions for children in uh, peace agreements, which makes sense, but there is no link between you know other groups. So um, indigenous, uh, you know, provisions, um, there's no correlation there, as well as just kind of broader um, things that we assume inherently benefit women more. So there's actually no statistical link between um, education and women's inclusion or like provisions for education and uh, women's inclusion 
or um, you know reparations, that kind of thing. But I think that that's something to look into more in terms of if women are at the table, who else is kind of being included um, in discussions. Uh, so thanks so much. I hope that that answered your question. If it didn't, it's the, ri it's the rising tide framework. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Wonderful. All right. Great. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. Really appreciate it. Um, a question for both uh, you, Elizabeth, and you, Alex, um, that was posed that is, uh, the, how are you able to categorize the, the question of women's participation? And I guess in Northern Ireland, perhaps in an, in an earlier context, that might have been easier. But Today, when we look at peace negotiations, are, are you looking at uh, sort of all uh, gender, uh, all genders on the spectrum, and and or um, where do the nuances of the different ways in which people present their identity uh, these days? Is this something that you have taken into account in your research that you're able to? How do we confront these notions, um, which are so important? Do you want me to go first, Elizabeth? Since you guys picked the last one, um, yes, this is a very good and important question. And of course, um, in the 1990s, well, of course, you know, people al along all sorts of identity um, markers existed, it wasn't something that was being actively talked about or considered. Um, but I think it is a really important actively talked about considered in the public governmental negotiation sphere. Um, it's a really important question, especially in a place like Northern Ireland, where a you have a narrative that says well we had women's inclusion so therefore everybody is like accounted for which is certainly not the case um at kind of pertaining to the last question certain women's experiences cannot speak to everybody's experience women are not a monolith and they're diverse experiences absolutely and so one of the things um, that I think is really important when we're thinking about outcomes of peace agreements and then like the legacy and lived experience of them, um, which was originally part of my research and then COVID happened. And so that will be a further project um, is really what have the institutions and the legal frameworks that come out of agreements meant for different groups. Um, how do they have the same access to resource and protections uh, that other groups might? I mean, for, for example, in Northern Ireland, the agreement really situated politics in terms of the two community um, situation. And so you see this um, reality where for other groups that maybe don't identify as being part of the Protestant unionist community or the Catholic nationalist community, that their needs are left out or harder to access um, governmental funding or lots of other things. And so the this idea of how do other identities fit into this is critical um, and something that I think is kind of like the next the next step in a lot of this research. Great. Elizabeth, did you want to add something? Yeah, so um, just in terms of like, I, I interpreted this question to reference gender identity in particular in referencing that gender is a spectrum. Um, and so how, how am I coding, you know, like uh, women versus not. Um, and so I went through um, and coded uh, if an individual's name was statistically linked to um, a woman's name in a cultural context and then hand coded for anything that wasn't or I like looked up individuals if uh, there was some ambiguity there and made sure to reference um, within the paper that I was you know women presenting or not as opposed to women and men because gender is not a binary um, and that's something that I think needs to be discussed, I think, more um, within this particular research and figuring out a different and a better way to kind of um, address that is important and, and a next step in this research. Great. Um, thanks to you both. And I, I'm going to ask one more question for both of you, uh, because it was actually posed to both of you in the chat from Alexander Marlowe, which is, how can gender specific provisions be implemented without violating, and I'm, I'm not going to reference any one specific, but anti-discrimination acts 
kind of across the world when we're talking about peace negotiations. So how can we seek for this inclusion without it being exclusive of others? And is this something that either of you have considered in the scope of your research? Uh, okay, well, not being a lawyer, I'll do my best to answer this. And there are two things that come to mind um, for me. One is kind of a dodge of the question, but I think it's also relevant, is that um, thing there, there are ways in which we can understand, look at, and address gender differences um, in elements of an agreement um, that don't need to specify gender at all. Everything will have different impacts depending on where you're situated within society. Um, and so a really interesting example of this was when I was going through the archives um, and I was looking, it's very dense, um, but through the minutes of a particular uh, plenary session that took place. And what was being talked about was boycotts of businesses that were taking place and how this um, was affecting the business owners and, and what it meant for their economic well-being. And um, this was all framed in, talk, in terms of the economic well-being of these business owners. And who are the business owners? By and large, tends to be men. Who are the people who are accessing these businesses who need to cross into, you know, across parts of the cities that might not be safe for them because of these boycotts, by and large women. And that's completely absent from the conversation. And so it's not just about thinking, how do we, how do we include specific gender provisions, but also how, what are the gendered impacts of this issue? So that's um, kind of a dodge of the question, not, not knowing the legal piece of it, but it's a really interesting question too, because in Northern Ireland, because again, the conflict was seemingly defined in terms of the two communities, equality is seen as between the two communities. And so what's done for one community must be done for the other community. And that has gone on to define how all forms of equality are understood. So in terms of gender equality, if it's done for men, for women, in seen as needing to be done for men in a legal sense. And so that's resulted in some really interesting uh, dynamics of how do we think about gender equality in um, ways that, or, or what are the impacts of some of, of some of these choices on gender equality? Um, so that's just an interesting um, way that this has played out that might not be uh, what first comes to mind. Great, thank you, Alex. Um, Elizabeth, yeah. Yeah, I, I love Alex's uh, approach and that like all provisions, you know, speak can speak to um, and benefit women. So I think that that is incredibly valid. I'll also say that in uh, a lot of peace negotiations or comprehensive peace negotiations anyway, a lot of them turn into uh, constitutions. So you're, having this opportunity to kind of draft law in the process. Um, but again, I'm not a lawyer. That's kind of um, tangential to, to the actual research or like what I'm looking at. Um, but thank you so much for, for the question. Um, I'm, I'm gonna ask another that came in over the chat, which is um, Alex and Elizabeth, obviously you have research that is on similar topics. Is there a plan for a book? And you know, we do like to think that at PON we bring people together. I was part of the committee that uh, that chose to have you both on this year. And obviously we noted the similarity and thought that it would be nice. So can we expect some collaboration uh, in the future? Hold tight. <laughs> we, we're, we're planning to start with an article maybe work our way towards a book that, that is great we will happily have you on to present it for a pon live book talk uh when when that happy day uh comes all right great thanks to you both i'm going to turn to some questions for um katri on on her very interesting presentation katri we did have one uh, person who wanted to get a a, a formulated explanation of the theory of legal design in, you know, two minutes, if you were able, um, so that she was uh, able to understand that concept. Oh, okay, that's great. So I guess, first of all, maybe say that there is a lot of variation for the definition of legal design. 
And it seems that uh, there is as many definitions that there is probably practitioners. But I have been defining legal design in few sentences. So I'm actually happy to read it for you. It's from my earlier work. So the idea of legal design is to make judicial information, services, products, and processes more approachable and understandable by using humor-centric design. More user-centric approach to law is reached by combining design methods, as well as the latest innovations in the field of law and technology. Other fields of science are used to find best practical solutions at legal challenges at hand. So maybe we can actually imply straight already from here that legal design learns from many different methods. And as regards design methods, this is usually the case by using plain language. So a language that is understandable for everybody. Because as we know that unfortunately, the language that us lawyers use is highly problematic, obscure, and really difficult for lay people to understand. So the magic with the legal design is that we are using a language that is understandable for everybody. And legal design, it can also benefit from other fields of science. So for instance, uh, it, can, it can build in from um, uh, learnings from engineering or neuroscience, for instance, for the way how we are laying out information, for instance, in documents. What is the best way for our friends to learn new things, to convey the information? So it can actually learn from many different fields of science. But I would say that the main magic is there that we are using uh, vocabulary that is understandable for people who doesn't have a legal background or that they don't need to hire a lawyer to actually understand what is being said. Wonderful. Thank you, Katri. I really appreciate that. And you definitely have at least one person putting in that they really appreciate uh, this, this fascinating development and, and wants to know, how can we, you issued a call to action, right? How can we encourage lawyers to adopt a legal design approach? Oh, that's a great question. Um, of course, the study what I conducted is a really small study and is only in a, one specific industry. But I, I hope that in the future, we will see more studies and particle studies done in the legal design sphere. And maybe through the fact that we are gaining more data, more empirical data, we would be able to facilitate the employment of legal design within the practice of lawyers, that we can actually prove better that, yes, it does make a difference uh, whether it be the risk management or the way how we serve our clients. So I would say maybe through the quality practice. And actually, that's a great question, Olde, for another regard, that I'm, I'm, a, I'm holding a course on legal design on the coming summer. So if somebody is interested to learn more of the application of legal design in commercial contracts, um, I'm more than glad to invite you for my course at Hankin School of Economics for the coming summer. So please drop me a line if there is anyone who is interested to participate. <laughs> Lovely, thank you so much, Katri. And one last question for you, and then I am afraid we're gonna be nearing time, so we're gonna wrap up, but um, there was a question about AI developments uh, and wondering if you were considering artificial intelligence as something that could aid in a process of a, a legal design application. Thank you for the excellent questions, yes. I think technology can bring a lot of advantages and benefits for us employing legal design. And for instance, how these technologies are being decided, because I regard them as being like a more uh, a way of systematically creating a system. So like a complex system theory way. So if we are taking when we are designing these technologies, for instance, already the legal design approach into the account at the first stage, we are maybe able to create more high quality legal services because the data that we are kind of feeding for these uh, programs or machines that can make a lot of difference. So I'm actually really looking forward to see what the future holds for these new technologies on this regard. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Katri. And thank you uh, to all of our fellows and, of course, to everyone who has tuned in today uh, for this uh, session. And I'm very proud of the work of all of our fellows and also, you know, presenting in front of over 150 people at peak on a Zoom uh, is, not, uh, is not easy. To everyone who's asked, I'll remind you that this uh, session was recorded. It will be posted to the PON Live website, uh, to the PON uh, events website. 
uh, next week. So you'll be able to review, share, uh, and also uh, revisit all of the slides and all of the information that was presented here today. Uh, we have uh, a number of upcoming events. Uh, we will be uh, hosting a, a discussion in partnership with Northwest Northwestern Kellogg on managing conflict mindfully. Len Riskin uh, will be visiting us on June 26th. And then, of course, as ever, a number of programs. I will um, shout out one that is a little bit different from uh, the usual programs that we lead here at PON, but we are one of the sponsors of a brand new Harvard Climate Forum. You see it under one day programs here happening on July 14th. It is an in-person program taking place on the Harvard campus and it is for interested members of the public who want to know, irrespective of their professional uh, expertise, how they can leverage their leadership skills to make an impact for climate change and sustainability. So I'm very proud that PON is one of the sponsors of this event. Uh, it is not negotiation focused, but it could not be more critical. I hope we see you at a, another online or in-person event very soon. Thank you once again to everyone for joining us today. Be well, and if you're in the US, enjoy a long Memorial Day weekend. Bye.